the chair of the board of directors here at Burnside Gore Association, and I would like to thank everyone for coming this evening and joining us with our council candidates and now for our mayoral candidates forum. Um, so, on behalf of the association, thank you very much. Uh, before we start, I would just like to say one, one word of thanks to Burnside Gorge Community Association staff and volunteers who put this together for us, set up all our chairs, did our snacks. Thank you so much. If we could just give a little... So, tonight is an opportunity to hear the views of our mayoral candidates. Um, I'm just going to give you a bit about the format. We're going to start off with some introductions. Each candidate will have two minutes to introduce themselves. Um, then we'll move on to the question period. Just, I want to emphasize, this is a forum, not a debate. So, th that to me means a lot. That to me means that they're going to respond to questions to the public, not to each other, and likewise. So, I have all, the, all questions, I hope, that were submitted in advance and a lot of extra. So we'll see. Rachel's waving some back. We'll see where we get, Rachel. Um, and so each, question, each um, candidate will have the opportunity to respond to the questions that we get through um, for one minute. Um, because of time restrictions, again, we're not asking for questions from the floor. Uh, we've been <clears throat> collecting them at the door and for the last couple weeks by email. So hopefully if you had a an urging question, you actually wrote it down. If not, the candidates may be able to stick around after, may not, but they're also available by Facebook, by email, phone, I don't know. There's lots of ways to contact them, so. Um, what else do I have to say? We picked an order for how we would ask the questions and we will just proceed back and forth. I think that's clear. I think we should. Oh, and Tracy's going to be timekeeping. Our vice president, lovely Tracy James. I, I, um, I actually have set a timer on you, and we will be ruthless uh, in cutting you off if necessary. I'll also give you kind of a 10 second warning if I think you're headed towards the end. Perfect. Okay, so um, first speaker is Jason. Uh, two minute intro. Hello, my name is Jason Ross. I'm a software developer by trade. Um, the main purpose of software development is to analyze a system and look for ways to improve it. Most candidates running in municipal elections uh, will look at the system and, of government and try to fit themselves within it. When I look at our system of government, I look for ways to make it more efficient and more effective. I started to get involved in local government a few years ago when I noticed that council meetings in Victoria were not being recorded. This seemed very flawed to me, as that left only meeting minutes to capture the details of what was said. So I started showing up at council meetings with a set of three cameras, like the one there, and recorded meetings to post online on my YouTube channel. The most frequent comments uh, that I got were from staff and council. They were so happy to have a copy of their previous meetings to review when the same subjects came up again, as topics frequently do. This was so successful that within a year after I moved up north to pursue other work, Victoria had implemented their own video recording of council meetings and Esquimalt was soon to follow. This is just one example of many inefficiencies with the way the city is run. The city produces too much information by volume, with too little information in detail. That makes it impossible for any citizen to understand everything that the city does. If you want a lean, efficient council that is thorough, communicative, and easy to follow, please elect me as mayor of the city of Victoria. Children and an astounding one in two children of single mothers live in poverty in Victoria. 
The province of BC has the highest rate of child poverty in the country and has had inexplicably for nine of the last ten years. The provincial government stubbornly ignores this social crisis and BC remains one of only two provinces that doesn't even have a poverty reduction strategy. Changes the Clown has become increasingly distressed at the failure of governments to address this crisis of child poverty in our community. Um, uh, one in five children and one in two, that's right, half of all children of single mothers in Victoria live in poverty. Um, and Changes wants people to join him in calling for something to be done about that. Um, Changes the Clown believes that as the capital city of the province in the country with the highest rate of child poverty year after year, the city of Victoria should demonstrate, provide a demonstration of how this crisis can be addressed at the, at the uh, municipal level, despite the fact that it's not actually, I mean, formally it falls under provincial jurisdiction and not municipal jurisdiction. Nonetheless, I mean, there are things that the municipality definitely could do. Um, the, uh, the two main planks and changes platform uh, are affordable childcare and a living, a living wage. Um, uh, first is a, an affordable child care program at $10 a day, subsidized by the city. Um, the city of Vancouver recently announced $30 million in funding for new child care spaces in, uh, um, uh, at the municipal level. And so this provides a clear precedent for this sort of thing. I mean, Vancouver's doing it, so why, why can't Victoria? Um, the second, uh, second main platform plank is a living wage policy, similar to the one that's been in place in New Westminster since 2010. Um, the min BC's minimum wage is only 54% of the living wage for Victoria. Um, a full-time full uh, full minimum wage worker makes um, just over $1,600 a month. When we consider that the cost of daycare starts at about $800 a month, you can see why single mothers often can't work. Thank you so very much. And it truly is my honor, my privilege to be here. Um, to have been mayor in the city for the past six years. You know, we have been working, mayor and council, for what I see as a prosperous city, you know, a livable city, and a city that is progressive and green. And we have shown great success over the last six years, but there's so much more that is left to be done. As a prosperous city, economic development has been one of our key platforms. And with all of the efforts that we have, we've now got ourselves in a position today where even though over the last six years we've been bringing down the tax increases every year, in fact this year, the lowest tax increase in 14 years, we've been able to continue to do what's important to Victorians, invest in their people, make sure that key services are still there. In fact, this year we were even able to increase funding to our community centres, our senior centres and to our libraries. For us, our people in Victoria are extremely important, and we know that that's the key investment that you want to see. So affordable housing has been one of our major efforts, which we so great success on, same with housing. Economic development has also been one. And where are we today? Today, it is the best year in 15 years for hotel, hotel occupancy and tourism. We have an unprecedented building boom going downtown, but it's a sustainable development. Development that is moving from 1,000 people living downtown to 7,000. And we're looking forward to continue that trend. Overall, by 2030, we are looking to have 2,000 people living in the downtown. A prosperous city, a livable city, and a city that is progressive and green. One on the social justice side, knowing that we cannot afford to ignore those issues that are important to seniors and to community members. But we also need to know that it's important that we take care of the environment. Bus lanes, cycling, looking for alternate transportations, looking to build and support our local communities. These are the efforts, the successes, and the opportunities we look forward in the next four. Thank you so very much. Good evening, my name is Lisa Helps, and I would like to be your mayor. For the past 17 years, I've worked in Victoria in a number of leadership roles, bringing people together from a diversity of backgrounds, building strong teams, and taking action on things that matter to Victorians. I've worked with my neighbors to fill vacant storefronts in my own neighborhood. I've built affordable housing, and I've helped to create local jobs through community microlending, and at the same time, 
to prevent poverty. I've been, the, it's been my privilege to serve as your counselor for the last three years. And people say at the council table, I've worked hard, I've asked tough questions, that I'm inclusive, and that I've got a lot done. As your mayor, I will continue to support our small business community. I'll continue to work with you to build strong neighborhoods, a livable downtown, and a walkable, bikeable, healthy city for all of us. I have a clear, detailed, and focused plan to take action on these and other issues, and it would be my honor to serve as your mayor. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. My name is Stephen Andrew, and right now I wish that my birthday was in December. <laughs> but uh, it's not. It's just a couple days after Lisa's. A little bit about me. I actually live here in Burnside Gorge. Many of you may know me from television and radio, and I've been asking questions over the many years that I've been in television and radio, and to be honest with you, I wasn't getting answers recently, answers that I think many people sitting in this room want to hear. One of the issues that I had was the expenditure over the Johnson Street Bridge. We have a project that went from $42 million to $77 million. It was then meant to be $92.8 million. And we now know, since we're coming to arbitration, that it's going to be more. I was very, very concerned. So tonight, I really want to talk about the issues that are here. You live in the Burnside Gorge area. I want to talk about that. Let's talk about parkland. Parkland was taken out of the area when we built Rock Bay Landing. And I know there's about $2 million in the budget to acquire new land. If I am your mayor, I will negotiate and work with council to develop a new parkland to have either the province or the school board turn the land that is behind Birdside Gorge now into a new park to immediately replace that. One of the issues of that, and one of the benefits is going to be that we are going to save at least a couple of million dollars there. The other issue, when Rock Bay Landing went in, the police and the city promised this neighborhood that they would have two police officers to monitor the area. That did not happen. They cut it back to one. I can tell you, as your mayor, I will work with council to advocate for at least one other officer to uh, make this area safer and to patrol the area. You have seen this week one of the issues that we've seen in the Rock Bay Landing area is that we obviously have an addiction issue. Within the first 90 days, I'm going to call for a treatment and residential center, and I'm going to work with council and our partners of the province and locally to make sure we achieve that. I'm also going to set up a task force to deal with addiction. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ida Chong, and I want to first of all thank the Burnside Gorge Community Association for allowing us to be here and to meet with all of you. Uh, I was born and raised here in Victoria, but by training, I'm a professional accountant. And in that uh, aspect, I was, a, I was able to do uh, tax returns for people, understand how important it was to find savings. Uh, for the last number of years, though, I have been uh, in public life as well and believe strongly that it is an honorable uh, profession to be in to ensure that we manage things well on behalf of taxpayers' dollars. As a CGA and as a former small business owner and as someone who has 20 years in public service, I know that I have the skill sets and the abilities to manage the city's $209 million annual budget. So I've been uh, on the doorsteps and asking people what are the issues that are important to them. And a number of things have come up. And one of them is, in fact, the mismanagement of the Johnson Street Bridge project. Uh, I've been hearing that people are concerned about whether the final costs are actually in. Uh, it's at $92.8 million now, but there are estimates that there could be another 10 to $15 million more. And that is a great concern because that was not what was originally intended. And that will hit your pocketbooks. The other issue that I have been hearing about as well is about the sewage standoff that is currently in place. And the debate about sewage treatment I know has been ongoing for at least 25 years when I was a teenager. But the fact of the matter is that uh, we have two levels of government who are willing to provide dollars there 
And if we don't move on that, those will be gone and we will be saddled with the additional cost. The other issue I've been hearing on the doorsteps and in coffee shops is the property taxes here in Victoria. And in the past six years, they have gone up by 34%. Thank you very much. We'll start with the questions, and Ida, you're you're up first. So, yeah. Um, so the first question submitted to us, um, it's a two-part question. Where do you stand on the introduction of a safe injection site in downtown Core Victoria, um, which includes Birdside Gorge? Um, and given that location, why downtown Core Victoria, as opposed to a site that has services and supports already available, such as the Jubilee Hospital? One minute, right? Yep. For everyone, yes. For everyone. Each person. Total. Thank you very much for whoever submitted the questions. And I do want to begin by saying I do support a, what we could call a supervised uh, injection site, a safe injection site, uh, because I have seen how it has uh, benefited uh, people in Vancouver, uh, where ensuring that they have a supervision, that they do not have uh, needles that end up in places like playgrounds and parks. So a safe injection site, a supervised injection site, also allows those who go to these uh, places will also have access to support services that are needed so that they, we can find ways to help people who are struggling with addictions and trying to provide the uh, housing that they may need, provide some training, just providing the extra supports that they need. Finding a place uh, for a supervised injection site I know has not been easy, and I've seen this uh, happen in the last number of years in Victoria in terms of the debate that goes on. People do not want them in their neighborhood, but at the same time, I do believe it's important to educate people and to make sure that they know that safety is the priority uh, when they are placed or when, when whatever location is chosen. Thank you. I support a safe uh, consumption site. Uh, however, I believe that there should be intervention in there on an ongoing basis, as frequently as we possibly can, to try to uh, assist the people who are addicted to move into treatment and recovery. Again, I mentioned that we are, I think we also need more beds in the region. If we are going to have a safe injection site, we need to make sure that we can deal with the capacity should those individuals be moved into uh, recovery and into treatment. And I am proposing that we talk to the province and see if we can get uh, the uh, Vancouver Island uh, Regional uh, Youth Correction Center that would give us 65 beds. I think that would make a huge difference uh, in our downtown core. Where, where should it be? Well, as I just pointed out, wherever we put it, we are going to have an issue. But I believe it should be close to services in case, obviously, that we have an overdose. Now, I can tell you right now, what you're not being told is that the Island Health is already looking at four locations and they haven't released that information to you or the council. Thank you. Uh, I too, like Ida and Stephen, support a safe consumption site. Uh, it's a health service and it saves lives. We don't know where the location is going to be. One of my strengths, and anyone who's out there who knows me knows this is true, I listen. And I'm also really good at developing win-win situations. So I, I actually don't agree that no one's going to be happy with this in their backyard. We've worked with Island Health and others uh, to put uh, more services at a site on Pembroke Street. A good neighbor agreement was negotiated with Island Health, the neighbors, and there was a lot of fear, and we haven't had very many, if any, complaints. And you know what? People are getting services where they need them. This is a health issue. My preference would be that we have a safe consumption site and a doctor's office and maybe a massage therapist and all of the things that we all need to take care of ourselves. And I will listen. So thank you very much, and, and I also agree that we need supervised um, uh, consumption sites. They need to be based on what we call the Dr. Peters model. If you have an opportunity to go to Vancouver, you'll see there's this insight, which is the one in the downtown east side, which probably gets most of the attention. But what people don't know is using a medical model. 
uh, called what? Under the Dr. Peters, is it's actually at St. Paul's, it's in a residential neighborhood, and it's extremely successful. We've been working with Vancouver Island Health Authority, Kool-Aid, and others to actually develop those two models, knowing that we need two locations. So currently, we have set up medical models and medical hubs on the Fisgard location and also the Cook Street location. And that is where you can get medical services, you can get detox services, you can get access to all your community health services, and you can also get access to um, needles and other things. Both of those are set up for expansion to safe consumption sites once the community and island health are ready to do that. And so we look forward to seeing those move forward, hopefully within the next year or so. I also want to highlight that we've worked closely with that to work on the youth treatment site at the old youth custody center, and we're working for 25 units expansion of Seven Oaks for those that are most mentally addicted. Mentally ill and addicted. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I agree with uh, everyone. It's uh, obviously uh, something that's needed in the community. You know, a safe injection site would save lives in the community. Um, uh, I'm really glad that that everybody seems to have good ideas about it, you know, it's encouraging. Um, uh, I mean, uh, uh, in Vancouver, I remember hearing a, a story in the news just recently, maybe some of you heard the same story. In Vancouver, they, I think it was over the weekend, or it might have been a single day, but they had 16 overdoses in the, the Insight location. And I, I, had that location not been there, that, I mean, stands to reason that it might have been one of 16 deaths instead of 16 saved lives. Um, so I guess, you know, it's obvious that it's a good thing and that's needed. Uh, locating it is obviously the, the tricky part, you know, given that it is needed. That's all I have to say. Uh, well, to, for the sake of being redundant, I also support uh, safe <laughs> consumption sites. Um, and I also agree um, uh, with what Andrew said, that I, I think there does need to be um, support and, and other services at the same location so that people who are going to inject or consume whatever it is they're going to take uh, have somebody to check in with them and keep up with them. I think there's two main things about uh, drug abuse that I, I want to make a point of. One, drug abuse is not a crime, it's a medical issue. Drug addiction is a medical issue. And secondly, we tend, when we deal with these sort of problems as a municipal level, they're treated as statistics. And each statistic, each number is an individual, and they need to be treated like people. So I believe that we should be treating these people as individuals, building those relationships, and, and helping them create, get the support that they need to help pull themselves out of the spiral that they're in. As well as, I, I believe, long term, we need to decriminalize all, all drugs. But uh, that's a conversation for another day. The next question, it's, it's yours. Yep. Uh, where do you stand on amalgamation? Another good question. It's also quite complicated. Um, I believe that amalgamation is inevitable, um, but I don't think that we should be looking at the municipalities first. I think we should be looking at amalgamating services. Uh, and. Particularly, I don't think we need 13 fire departments. I don't think we need the eight or nine police departments that we have. I think uh, even services like public works or parks and rec, you could take a lot of the, certainly the administrative and the overhead, and amalgamate that into a central service and have, you could still have municipal workers, but they could, do, they could work from a pool of equipment. Do we really need every municipality to have, you know, their own so source of dump trucks and, you know, uh, heart, you know the, jackhammers and every other piece of equipment that a, a permit worker needs. And I think that's where we need to start the conversation, is to start looking at what is it that we can save by pooling our money together and, and providing the same service across the whole board. Um, yeah, amalgamation seems like a, a, a good thing as far as I, I, uh, as far as I can tell um, from what I've heard about it. Uh, um, I lived in uh, Ontario, um, I was a grad student in Ontario around the time when they amalgamated um, Metro Toronto. Uh, and it is a complicated thing, but I mean, surely on that, I mean, just simple deductive logic suggests that, you know, 13, 13 municipalities and 350,000 people, that's a little bit crazy. Um, uh, so yeah, it seems like a logical sort of a step to me. Um, part of, probably part of a growing city, you know, something that a growing city needs to do. Oh, 
Thank you very much for the question. Um, I do believe in amalgamation. I believe that amalgamation will provide both effectiveness uh, and efficiencies. Efficiencies is about saving money. Now let's be clear, we're still going to need the same amount of garbage trucks and, and garbage workers at that same level. We're still going to need park workers. But there will be some efficiencies that we can find in the management level. And that's where the most gains are going to happen. We're also going to get way more effectiveness. Especially, well I should say this, amalgamation done well <laughs> can lead to this. And that is going to be the important question. Um, but we can still get those effectiveness. As Jason said, opportunities for police departments to actually be one and work together. We've seen how many gains can happen there. Same thing with fire and uh, many of those essential services. You probably know that we deliver water, which is a CRD function to everyone here. Um, I think after November 15th, we're going to have a clear opportunity to bring together what I'm going to call the coalition of the willing. Those members who have voted to say, okay, Victoria, Sandish, others, let us come together and start moving forward in the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I got into public office, I was working on a PhD on the history of Victoria and San Francisco, a comparative study. And I was reading the Times columnist from the 1930s and they were talking about amalgamation. So this conversation has been going on for a long time. I am very glad that we are going to ask you on November the 15th what you think. And when the results come back, I will listen to those results. And anyone who knows anything about me knows that I'd like to make evidence-based decisions. So we'll study, we'll work with the province, we'll work with the other municipalities to dig into the question. I think we definitely need fewer municipalities, but I'm waiting to hear what you think on November the 15th. In the meantime, I can guarantee you that we can work much better together than we are now. Thank you. I'm absolutely pro amalgamation. I'm not convinced that it's going to save money. In fact, every time I ever did a story on this, I was reminded of Halifax and Toronto that it didn't. But I believe it's going to provide better governance. To sell amalgamation to the citizens of this region that it's going to save money, I think is not exactly uh, appropriate. Uh, amalgamation has become a dirty word in this uh, city and across the region. In fact, we even call it the A word now. Sometimes we, on television radio, we won't even say the full word. I'm concerned that we would try to go to an amalgamation of services first, but now I just want to point out one thing. Look at the cooperation that we've had on sewage. We were ordered to do it in 2004. Here we are, 10 years later, we spent more than $62 million and we don't have a shovel in the ground. We've also tried to um, amalgamate our regional police force. You would never set up a police force like this. Certain politicians did not provide leadership on this. And I think we need friendly. to do that. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And I, too, would like to say that it is really important that the ballot question for the first time and that I can remember uh, is on the uh, ballot this year for all of you to decide. And I do believe that it's important for the council to respect the decision that you all make uh, when November 15th rolls around. There have been so many straw polls about amalgamation. I always was reading uh, the papers or hearing it on the radio. But until you actually exercise that vote, we don't know what the will of the people are. And I do believe it's important to respect that. What I also know, though, is that as taxpayers, you want your civic leaders to do their very best to find cost savings wherever possible. And that means integration of services, that means collaboration and working with other regional partners, then we should be looking at that. But you want to remain, uh, ensure you maintain your essential services as well. When I see small businesses, they'll move from a few kilometers to another kilometers in terms of uh, municipalities, they too want a better cooperative and collaborative means of doing that. Okay, we're gonna move on to the next question for Ida. And I think it's somebody's Blackberry up here that is maybe you have a Blackberry. Beep, 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 beep. It's the Blackberry searching for okay. and sending so, information. <laughs> so it's the Blackberry that's causing that beep beep, just so you know. Uh, can you guys hear Stan? Yes. Okay. So maybe those can go off just for a little while. Uh, okay. Next question for Ida. We'll back to you to start off this round. Do you think that the residents of Victoria should be paying a higher percentage of the property taxes? so that the business property tax can be reduced. If not, 
Do you believe the business property tax is driving businesses out of town? And what are you prepared to do to change this? Thanks very much. Well, what I have already indicated is one of my key priorities if uh, elected as your mayor is I would freeze the property tax meal rates for the next four years. So whatever that rate currently is, whether it's the one that is at the business rate or at the residential rate, that will be frozen. As I've indicated, I've seen that the last six years, the residential rates have actually gone up a cum cumulative 34%. Now, I also want to be clear that when you have a mill rate freeze, it doesn't necessarily mean that there would not be extra revenues that the city can generate. You want to grow the tax base, that clearly that would need more people coming in, but it also means that if your assessments are increased, that mill rate can possibly be decreased as well. Uh, I also want to ensure that uh, people are aware that when you are looking at controlling that spending, uh, by ensuring that the revenues that you have, that you spend within your limits, that you are accountable to the people who are sending those dollars to you, and that's what I would expect you want of your mayor. Stephen. Thank you. I promise that uh, I'm going to respect your money, and I'm not going to waste it. I think the politicians all too often think that they deal with monopoly money, and it's not money that you and I have gone out and earned and sweated, uh, blood, sweat, and tears to get. Um, when you say, should we level out the business tax with the property, with the residential property tax, I believe that one of the key issues that we need to do is to reduce our taxes on our citizens. And let's look at a typical example of that. I mean, I just pointed out the, uh, the bridge project, you know, we went from uh, 42 to 98 million, we're looking at 63 million dollars basically on the uh, sewage treatment, we haven't done anything. I think we need to start taking uh, a, a task where we look at efficiencies within the city so that when we look at our budget on an annual basis that we limit those tax increases as much as we can to ensure that we don't keep dipping into your pocket or raising parking fees in downtown. It's not appropriate and I think that we need to take a new look at the way that we work. Thank you. The last thing Stephen said is a good jumping off point for me. We need to take a new look at the way that we work in City Hall. So I will answer the question. If there's time left, I'll tell you about that new look. Uh, right now, businesses pay three times the amount of property tax as residents. And it is our small business community that provides a place for us to go get our fries bread on the other side of the trestle bridge. Uh, that is uh, supporting new business startups, Wheelies Motorcycle in Rock Bay. As council, we've, we've shifted a little bit, very, very partially, a little bit of the tax burden from business to residential. I think we've done a good job. We need to support our small business community and here's where it gets interesting, not at the expense of residential taxpayers. My commitment is to keep property taxes in line with inflation, not by cutting and slashing, but by asking our frontline staff to be creative innovative, and to look for cost savings. They're empowered and we need to work with that. Thank you very much. It has been very important for us in the City of Victoria to balance out the business tax uh, ratio, which was as high as seven point, uh, sorry, 3.7, down to where we are now, three to one. Part of the reason in understanding that is the business can write off those taxes, 100% of their taxes, whereas you as a property owner cannot. So if you try to understand why there's a ratio difference, that perhaps provides a little bit. But letting that know, it's still important to recognize that they do pay 50% of the taxes within the city of Victoria. Now over the last six years, for every single year, we have been reducing our property tax increases. And I do say increases, and I get that. But we aren't a federal or provincial government. We don't have a $2 billion deficit like they did last year. They don't have, we don't have a $45 billion debt where we're mortgaging the future of our children. The city of Victoria has basically raised taxes for inflation, and then we've included 1.25% tax increase every year to build up our infrastructure reserves from $75 million to $125 million to take care of those infrastructure challenges of the future. Uh, I'm in favor of uh, shifting the tax burden from 
uh, business to residential? No, I'm, I'm not in favor of doing that. Um, and if not, then what would I do to prevent the business tax from driving driving business out of the uh, out of the downtown core? Well, I think a living wage policy, you know, making Victoria a living wage community, would go a long way to doing that. Um, when you uh, when you um, give low paid workers a, a more money, when you put more money in their pockets, that has a multiplier effect in the community. It creates a new dynamic where um, all all that uh, that extra money that they're that the low paid workers are earning. It's spent right in the community on basic needs. It doesn't, for example, get tend to get ferreted away into a retirement fund or spent on a winter vacation in the tropics, you know, removed from the community in one of those kinds of ways. It's spent locally, it creates a powerful new dynamic in the local economy. I think a living wage policy would go a long way to, uh, to helping with that sort of thing. Uh, well, the city needs money, and that's always a challenge for every municipality, is that you need to find ways to increase revenues. And there's two main reasons that, ways that you can get money as a city. One is through tax, taxes, property taxes, and the other is through services. Um, so I think there needs to be a focus in both directions. We need to look at our uh, services and, and see, especially look abroad, look to other cities in our, in our region, in our province, and in our country and look for services maybe that we aren't providing or services that we're providing but we're not doing it efficiently enough. Try and find good ideas out there to actually raise money in ways that are upping the tax rate. But we also need to look at ways of, of creating efficiency. So we do need to look at the way that our city is doing business. Are, do we have too many, manage, too many managers in, in different areas? Do we, are we not really using technology in the same, in a, in a productive way? Is there ways that we could take the information that we're trying to work with and, and process it in a way that actually saves money? <laughs> well, it still stays the same order. I'm just not going back. Okay. <laughs> so, with respect to traffic calming, uh, pedestrian, and cycling infrastructures, what specific steps would you take to make sure that the allocation of resources is distributed fairly between neighborhoods and to address the inequality that currently exists? Uh, thank you. And that's a very good question because it always does become a challenge between the uh, sometimes the additional cycling that we want for the city for people who are commuting, uh, as well as for the vehicles that are still wanting to come downtown and shop in the and the small businesses and, the, and, and be a part of the downtown community. I'm not an expert when it comes to determining where the traffic calming should be. It's up to, I believe, residents and community associations to provide that information so that city staff are aware and can come out and have a look at uh, those particular areas and see whether or not it makes sense to have traffic calming. I used to serve on a traffic advisory committee in a uh, previous council and that's what we would ask the police to do. Come out, have a look at the area, tell us whether we need to change the traffic pattern, traffic speeds, provide traffic calming. And you ask those experts who provide that information, whether they're the engineers, whether they're the police who know about safety issues where pedestrians and cyclists and motorists cross. Thank you. I think we need to use evidence-based decisions on what we are going to institute to traffic calming. And certainly that has not been happening at City Hall. We've been making emotional decisions. So I think that we need to make decisions based on evidence. Um, I think we need to take a balanced approach. I have been on the doorstep and I've heard from several neighborhoods, not this one, but several neighborhoods that say they're not getting the attention that they deserve. One of the things that I'm going to do is to provide uh, the citizens of Victoria a direct link to council. I'm going to set up a series of portfolios, and one of those portfolios will be development and planning, a counselor in charge of dealing with that, so you know exactly who to go to, and that we can deal with it on a global basis with the City of Victoria, rather than piecemeal out the projects as we do now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is something that we've struggled with in this past council, and every neighborhood feels like we're not doing enough in their neighborhood. 
The solution that I believe is uh, the one to go with is actually proposed by Councillor Shelley Gudgeon, who's not running again. And she said probably about a year ago, what we need to do is follow Edmonton's lead and create a great neighborhood initiative. On my platform page, it's called a great neighborhood project. And that brings together leaders from all of the neighborhoods, and I know this is happening organically already, with city staff from across departments and with council, because we're each appointed to a neighborhood, to say, in, the, in this is what I propose, in the next four years, what are we going to do to make every neighborhood in this city great? So you can go to my website to read more. In terms of evidence-based decision-making, one of the things that I am convinced of in my bones is that engineers and police are really important and people know the places that they live and they have expert feelings, expert evidence from living in those places and we need to listen to that as well. Thank you so very much. Um, there's many <clears throat> answers to so many questions and this is a quick one. Traffic calming is really important. We understand that lowering speed limit is an indication that really if you want to have results, you have to do what's known as traffic calming, whether it be roundabouts, whether it be speed bumps, whether it be squeezing uh, the roads. Many ways to accomplish that. Bike lanes, big trees on the side of the roads that overhang. All of those are wonderful ways that you can slow traffic. Downtown is important. Everybody uses downtown. And we're really pushing forward on a cycling master plan that looks to have segregated bike lanes in the downtown. That's a big piece. Because generally, in every neighborhood, you can get down there but you actually need to be safe when you're in the downtown core. We will also look for development opportunities to save you money. But what are we doing? We've committed $5 million over the next four years to make those changes in communities and neighborhoods. It's funny, what I hear is everybody wants their street to be really slow, and then once they get off their street, they want to go, and we need to make sure that we understand. If I just end with this, safety is the first key to making decisions. Secondly, those decisions that bring the biggest gains. And thirdly, local preferences. Good question. Thank you. Sorry about that. As far as allocation of uh, resources for things like bike lanes and traffic calming and um, traffic issues generally, um, uh, plank number six on the changes for mayor platform is, uh, is highly relevant. Uh, free buses. Um, uh, the idea is for, for the city to explore the idea of some sort of free buses. Fair free public transit is not, not unheard of. It's not, you know, it's not that uncommon. It's much more common in Europe than it is anywhere else. But there are ways of doing it. And that would, tra just, that would transform the traffic situation in, in Victoria. You get um, a lot of people riding the bus instead of driving you know, single, single occupant cars all over the place. Crazy. Um, you know, the need for bike lanes might, might be alleviated or you know, it would certainly be effective. Um, and uh, um, I don't know, I, I just think that would have a transformative effect on all traffic related issues in the city. I think it's something that should be looked into. Jason? Good time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I believe that uh, traffic calming measures are very important. Um, we can't just drop the speed limit because people will drive the speed that the road is built for. So we do need to make those traffic calming measures, but there really need to be areas where we've got local neighborhoods, and, and I think that's a bigger issue, especially here in Burnside Gorge. We've, the biggest issue with this neighborhood is that there's too many arterial roads. This road, this neighborhood split on Gorge Road, on Burnside, on Douglas, on Blanchard. You know, we ought to look at some of these roads. I think Gorge in particular is kind of the road to nowhere. It really ought to be, that's a one that really should be slowed down put more curves, put more bar barriers to prevent people from driving quickly, and actually encourage commercial development on the ground floor to create an actual village. You know, Cook, uh, <coughs> Cook Street Village is a great example of a really nice, small, local community. There's lots of res residential around, but there's an essential set of businesses. You can't even buy, go to, buy groceries in Burnside Gorge. You know, like, there really ought to be little communities. We ought to be building villages, and those are the areas where we should be focusing on living traffic. Next question. Thank you, Jason. How are we to trust, we'll leave it with Jason. Yeah. Sure. How are we to trust that the premise of community input means anything to you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> this is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. As I said in my introduction, 
I started getting involved in local politics because nobody was recording these meetings. And I've got my camera here today because these all candidate meetings are only going to be knowledge, you know, useful to the people who are in this room unless somebody's recording this stuff and posting it online. And there's two. There's a two-way street. There really needs to be more effort in encouraging the public to get involved. Um, I was getting ready for the, uh, the GPC meeting this uh, Thursday, the, the all can the uh, sorry committee of the whole meeting for Victoria, and going through the agenda. And it took me two almost two whole days to read every report and create notes and summaries of what each issue is going to be and start to create some questions that I think should be asked. And I'm going to be live tweeting this on Thursday, so if you follow me on Jason Ross on Twitter, you'll be able to see what I'm doing. But it's it's that two-way street. I think the city shouldn't just be creating communications for its own sake and, the same, and publishing publicly and say, okay, there we've done our job. I think they really ought to be tailoring the message for the public. Um, how, how, uh, how are we to trust that uh, community input means anything to you? Um, is that the question? Is that right? The premise of community input means anything to you. Yeah, okay. Yes. Um, well, yeah, I, I, I don't have time for a manifesto, but uh, yeah, the community input means absolutely everything to me. I'm a strong believer that um, there are ways in which uh, multiple forms of direct democracy could be integrated into our, into our political system to make it far more meaningful than it is. I think you know, voting, voting in an election every few years is just, as far as democratic involvement, participation goes, is really negligible to say the least. I mean. Really, uh, there are all kinds of ways in which community input could be integrated into the political process. Uh, well, I mean, by and large, we don't hear about these things. They're not well known because they can't be manipulated and controlled by money and so on, the way that electoral politics can be. You know, and, um, there are all kinds of uh, possibilities out there. One of the things I've been really proud of is Mayor and Council over the last six years have instituted what's known as a civic engagement strategy, and it has worked. We engage more than 7,000 people in the development of our official community plan. We engage more than 3,000 people in the engagement of our cycling master plan. We are the most open government Victoria has ever had. We had a review from the Ombudsman, and she had one recommendation, which is what you review after three months. Uh, you review any in-camera uh, meetings, and it's posted to the website, which we took in, and what we've done. Now, everybody can say they're for it, but you have to take a look at what we've done. We fund community centers, and we fund community associations, because that's a way to help support local community voices. And most recently, when we pulled together all of the developers to talk about how we could be more efficient and effective at City Hall, it was council ensured that the community associations were part of that conversation. So people can say, but what you really want to look at is what people actually delivered. I did, I knew who was coming next, it was me, thank you. Um, this is a really big one for me. What we do now, like the mayor said, we engage you when we've got to do the OCP, we engage you when we want to do the cycling master plan, and that's a good start. But what I'd like to see is you engage with us you tell us what we should be asking you. When I was elected, we set the 2012 budget and then we went out and asked you, what do you think? I thought, this is bizarre. And so then I went out with my monopoly money, not that I think we're spending monopoly money, to community centers from July until October. And I sat with over 200 people in small groups and I said, what are your thoughts? What are your ideas? And I typed up a 15-page report and I circulated it to Mayor and Council. I want to know what you think when you're thinking it, not when we think it's a good idea to engage you. Thanks. It's over to Stephen. Oh, that's safe. Thank you. I want you to vote for something, not against something. So one of the things I'm going to do when I'm in the Mayor's office, my monthly open door sessions will come directly into community centers and you will have an opportunity to sit down with Mayor and I hope Council will join us so that we can engage with you on a regular basis and we're moving it around. The Mayor says that uh, we're in a situation where we, the community centers, uh, the community, the neighborhoods have a lot of input. But I spoke to somebody in James Bay who's working on a development project. Uh, the James Bay Neighborhood Association rallied behind this project, said it was fantastic. 
When it got to council, council said, no, nope, doesn't fit. So you do have to be listened to, and I think that happens a lot. You bring forward ideas, you say what you want, and then you're not listened to. And I think that what we need to do is set up, as uh, one of my colleagues on the panel here is going to say, some kind of dialogue that's going to go back and forth, because you don't have time sometimes to go to council meetings. And anyone who sat in the council meeting knows it's extremely long. So I would like to see a situation where you can go online and actually provide your feedback in real time. Thank you very much. So what I'm hearing is perhaps what the uh, neighborhood associations, community associations want is, is accountability. And part of accountability means transparency. And transparency means that you get to see what uh, your council is deliberating, what they're discussing, what input you are providing, and how they're taking that input and making those decisions. What I have been distressed about is I have seen more uh, secretive in-camera meetings than ever before uh, that has taken place. And that's why you're not knowing whether your input is being valued. I believe that we need to reduce in-camera meetings to the bare minimum to what is absolutely essential. And that way you can see how your council, how your mayor is making decisions uh, based on what you have provided them. The uh, recent budget deliberations, I understand, only had public input for about 10 days. Uh, and pub and, or public consultation perhaps for 10 days and two hours of community input. Uh, that isn't enough for a $209 million budget. Okay, believe it or not, that has to be the end of the questions if we're gonna have a two minute roundup for everybody. I can't believe, I can't believe that. I have so many more questions. But, I, and I, but I'm gonna think about how I can get them out there to these folks. Um, so um, I'm gonna commit to that. And let's start uh, with Ida, I guess, for two-minute um, closure, wrap-up, whatever you want to call it. Thank you very much. And again, I want to thank the Burnside Forge Community Association for hosting us here this evening. I do believe that Victoria would be better served with a mayor who's focused on issues that matter to, to you all. And I've indicated a number of things uh, in my opening remarks as to what I've heard on the doorsteps, in the coffee shops, and talking to people as I meet with them. I know Victoria needs strong, proven, experienced leadership, and that is what I'm bringing to the table. With my financial experience, with the training that I have received as a result of that, working with uh, small business organizations, those are all important. I also believe that the downtown Victoria core needs to be energized. I grew up in this town and I do not recall seeing the amount of empty storefronts uh, that, that I have seen today. And I think it's a shame because I see those abandoned buildings and those abandoned storefronts as abandoned dreams and people's investments that have uh, driven, uh, been driven away. So as a community leader, my approach is to listen before I act and before I make decisions to receive all the research that is necessary and all the evidence that is available. And then I will make my decision. And you will know them because they will be open and they will be transparent at a council meeting. I do care deeply about Victoria. I'm passionate about it having the potential to be the very best it can be. We are the capital city of the province of British Columbia. And we should be the city that others are wanting to measure up to. Thank you, and I also would like to thank you for coming today. I'm really pleased that you are engaged and you care enough about your community that you're going to spend time with us to hear exactly what our vision is. I think it's extremely important. I hope that you will remain engaged throughout the next four years. On the door, I hear time and time again that it's time for a change. We cannot continue the way we have been going down. I hear about mismanagement, the mismanagement of the bridge project, the fact that the region cannot come together and deal with a sewage treatment center, and that we are spending your money, as one person at the door told me, like a bunch of drunken sailors. Well, I want to offer some sober thought here. We need to make evidence-based decisions that are balanced. Yes, we need to deal with the homeless situation, addiction, and mental health, but we also need to balance that against our business interests. We need to make sure that our city is thriving and safe. 
When we talk about downtown, we need to make sure that we can attract more businesses here. We talk about uh, a three to one tax ratio. And yes, in the city of Victoria, that is uh, uh, significant that we're going after business and they take 50% of the tax. But there are neighboring municipalities, ladies and gentlemen, that offer more favorable opportunities. We have to be competitive within this region if we are going to maintain business. And that's something our mayor is not going to tell you. We need to be open and transparent. The mayor sets the agenda along with a couple of other people, so you see what's on the agenda. Well, I will tell you what I'm going to do is provide you not only the agenda, what's there, but I will also show you what didn't make it on the agenda. So if you have a specific issue or interest, you will see what it is and you will see how long it is pending. What I really think we need to do, as has been brought up today, is make evidence-based decisions and we need to give you direct answers. So when you ask a question such as, that I've asked the mayor on a regular basis, you said that it would be on time and on budget with the bridge, yes or no, you get a direct answer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for your good questions. I would suggest uh, typing those up and emailing them to all of us, or better yet, in the interest of transparency, put them on Facebook and we can go and answer and share our answers on Facebook. I can do that. Yeah. Excellent. Um, I, I like Stephen here on the doorstep that people in Victoria are ready for a change. And not just a change in mayor and council, that happens every three or four years, but a change in the way we do business at City Hall. So that when you're a neighborhood association who comes in and wants to plant an orchard, it doesn't take you two years. We say, excellent, food security is, our, is in our official community plan. How can we help you make that happen? We have fantastic staff at the city. What we need to do is fix the way that City Hall works. If you want to come and open a business like Wheelie's Motorcycle over there on Rock Bay, you get straight answers. You get start to finish. Here's what you need to do. Because you know what? We all know this. We all go shopping every day for the things that we need. And it is our small business sector that is keeping us alive. And it is our neighborhoods, our neighborhood associations that are keeping us connected with each other. City Hall needs to be a platform for creativity, for innovation, for working with you to make your ideas see the light of day. That's what I'll commit to as your mayor. I have a clear, detailed, and focused plan. If you go to lisahelpsvictoria.ca, and yes, that is my real last name, you will see all of the things that I envision in our city for the next four years so that the kids who are running around our playgrounds today can afford to live here and thrive here until they're senior citizens visiting our senior centers. So thank you for coming and thank you for, uh, for participating in this really, really important process. Thank you, I appreciate you coming and spending some time with us this evening. Um, like you, I love this city. It's an amazing city. And as much as we'll talk about the environment, we'll talk about the architecture, it is the people and the communities that truly make us rich. Tonight you've heard many promises and you've heard some ideas. What I'm going to ask you to say is, take a look for the person who has the record, who has the experience, can actually back up commitments with actions and results, and is looking for that opportunity to continue to work on your behalf. We need to continue to invest in our communities, like this center. We need to continue to invest in our people. We need to invest in our economy, we need to invest in our environment. We see people coming downtown all the time. We see more and more people investing in our downtown as we go through this recovery. We've gone from 26 food trucks to 50 food trucks. In fact, I think the food trucks are all down there tomorrow. I mean, we've seen an explosion of food trucks and festivals and people all over downtown. Victoria is coming back and it's coming strong and it's coming vibrant. And we look forward to making sure that that happens over the next four years. Thank you very much. I'm very excited to be your mayor. I'm excited to be a candidate. Thank you. Changes is in the race to, uh, to raise awareness about the issue of child poverty, which is a, a social and unacknowledged, unaddressed social crisis in our community. 
Uh, the two main platform planks are um, uh, affordable childcare and living wage. A third leg in that picture, which is kind of obviously missing from this platform, is social housing. Um, it seems to me that everyone's talking about social housing, and changes is really in the campaign to talk about things that other people are not talking about. Um, so that's why it's not, you know, it's left off the platform. Um, but uh, speaking of things that, uh, you know, people, other people are not talking about, something that probably very few people in this room have heard of, in my experience, this would be the case, is uh, coltan and coltan mining. This is point, uh, point number five on the, uh, on the changes platform. Coltan is a, a, a mineral that's mined in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is an element in every cell phone and electronic device that you buy. Um, the trouble is that uh, it's mined using slave labor, and that slave labor goes to fund endemic warfare, which has been going on ceaselessly in the region for 25 years. So every time you go out and replace your new your cell phone that you've owned for, well, I mean, see, people seem to line up to buy these things every three months or six months or something. You know, every time, next time you do that, think about the slaves in, in the Congo that have uh, had some input into that device that you're buying. So, you know, I'll just end on that note. Thanks. <laughs> Well, I think I'm going to end and try to make three points here. Um, one is, I think we need to have better planning. Um, we need to identify our risks. We need to put in monitoring processes when we come up with an idea to make sure that it's doing what we expect. Um, and, and we need to really get more detail focused as a, as a council when we're trying to make the hard decisions. We have to not just have happy ideas, but we have to actually back it up with real details. Um, Another aspect of what I want to focus on is, I want to introduce you, um, last summer I was out in the Northern Rockies on horseback uh, for two weeks, which was fantastic. Uh, and I met this guy, Wayne Sawchuk, who created this amazing process, called, uh, created this entire area of the Northern Rockies called the Muskwakachika Management Area. And the way that they created this was he got all the different interested parties together. So you got the hunters and the First Nations and the miners and the forestry workers and everybody who was, wanted to have some interaction with that territory. Uh, and he took out the easy parts first. So, okay, where is it that there aren't a lot of conflict and let's make those like uh, wilderness protection areas and, and to make sure because there's an abundant wildlife up there. It's like the Serengeti of the North. And he slowly got through harder and harder points until they finally hammered out a full act, and then they gave it to the provincial government. The provincial government did not build the Muskwakachika Management Act, the people built it, all the interested parties, and I think that's what we need to do with our local neighborhood plans. Get our residents, get our local businesses, get our people that are in the tourism business, people that want to travel through the area to get to where they're going. All the different people that are affected by a neighborhood should be getting together, either as a group and identifying areas of conflict and areas that there is no conflict, and then when there is conflict, go off to their individual groups, discuss the issue, come up with a proposal, come back to the table and find consensus. Yeah. And I'm going to give you a Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So you guys have been sitting a long time. I want, I want to thank you for, I want to thank three groups. First, the group sitting in the middle of the room. Thank you for coming. And thank you for your very thoughtful questions. I also want to thank the um, candidates for city council. I didn't mean to ignore you before. My apologies. You guys were here earlier. Some people came to meet and greet you. Thank you for your spending your, your evening with us and for sharing your views with the people. Thanks for thinking on the spot. Those were some tough questions. We will get the other questions to you somehow. I like your idea, Lisa. Facebook. I'm not a Facebooker. This is my Facebooker right here. <laughs> so thank you again for uh, thinking on the spot, sharing your views, and coming to join us this evening. Safe travels home, everyone. Good evening.